Okay. So hi, my name is Kristen Rohr and I'm one of three school psychologists in Bexley City School District. Uh, thank you for inviting and having me this evening. Um, it's exciting to be one of the first to get to go and to be a part of this um, exciting experience in terms of making this accessible to the community in ways that we haven't before. So thank you again for having me. Tonight's presentation is going to cover information related to evaluations, in particular around the special education testing process. So in the agenda, we will be reviewing the evaluation timeline. I'll be providing you with examples of different types of parent meeting requests. We'll also be differentiating between a medical disability versus what an educational disability looks like and we'll also go over the educational disability categories at the end. So this is what Ohio's evaluation process looks like. It's a comprehensive process that can take up to 120 calendar days to complete from start to finish. Once a school district receives a request for special education services from a parent or from a staff member, our school district must meet within 30 calendar days to determine whether special education testing is necessary. If we do deem that testing is needed, the school district will gather consent from the parent for the evaluation. Once consents received, we then have 60 calendar days to complete testing, review the results and determine whether the student is eligible for special education services. If the student is found eligible for special education services, the school district has 30 calendar days to write an individualized education plan or an IEP for the student. So again, while it seems in theory like it's a small process in the moment, comprehensively it can take up to 120 days to complete the entire process. So many parents often request meetings throughout the school year, and sometimes they're uncertain of what triggers our district to schedule a meeting within 30 calendar days. These are some of the common requests that our district receives that help trigger a meeting to be scheduled within 30 days. This isn't necessarily an exhaustive list, but it definitely gives us a starting point for parents in terms of the language they might use in an email or even in a verbal conversation to get the process started. These examples can include anything from a doctor requesting testing or asking for an IEP, a tutor suspecting learning challenges for a student, a significant history of disability with a family being reported, requests for student accommodations, and parents providing the school district with private evaluation information. In order to make certain your meeting request is promptly scheduled with our school district, we would like to provide you with the additional suggestions. First and foremost is to make certain your request for a meeting is always in writing. This helps to provide formal documentation for both you and the school district. Secondly, please copy a building administrator and a school psychologist on any meeting request, as this helps to ensure that your meeting will be scheduled within the appropriate timelines. It's also helpful for families to provide any medical documentation and or evaluation reports at the time of their meeting request. This helps to provide us a chance to review the information thoroughly prior to your student's meeting. So one of the topics that we wanted to discuss tonight and is often asked by parents and guardians is what is the difference between a medical di uh, disability and an educational disability? One thing to note is that a medical diagnosis does not automatically qualify your student for special education services. The key difference between an educational disability and a medical disability is that an educational disability must establish adverse impact on the student's educational progress at school. Now, what does educational progress mean at school? Most oftentimes, folks want to go directly to academic progress, but it's not only that. Educational progress can look at anything from a child's social skills to their emotional well-being 
as well as their behavior, activities of daily living, and their self-regulation skills. It's also parent, important for parents to know that there are only 13 educational disability categories provided by the state of Ohio. This means that many of our medical disabilities, such as ADHD and anxiety, do not fall under their own category and will fall under a specific educational disability category. So for example, many of our students with ADHD receive special education services under the educational category of other health impairment. So this is a list of the 13 different school age disability categories that Ohio provides, along with a developmental disability category that is only established for preschool. And I forgot to add that to this presentation, so we will have to update that. But there is a 14th category. It's developmental disabilities. And again, it is limited to preschoolers. So going through each of these categories, I want to make certain that people understand and that the community and parents understand that for each of these disability categories, we have to establish adverse impact on the child's progress at school. If you do not establish that, students are not eligible to receive special education services under any of these educational disability categories. For autism, some of the key um, identifiers that we are looking for in terms of eligibility are looking for verbal and nonverbal communication challenges or challenges in social interaction. They're generally evident before age three, and there are other characteristics that are often associated with autism, but are not necessarily needed for us to determine eligibility for school age services. These can look at engaging in repetitive activities, stereotyped movements, having um, resistance to change or adaptability, and unusual responses to sensory experiences. The term also does not apply if the child's educational performance is adversely affected because they have an emotional impairment. The next category would be deaf and blindness. And this is a simultaneous hearing and visual impairment, the combination of which causes severe communication and other developmental and educational needs that cannot just solely be accommodated by special education programs for children solely with deafness or children solely with blindness. Our next category is deafness, which is a hearing impairment that is so severe that a child is impaired in processing linguistic information through their hearing with or without amplification. And again, as you'll see on each of these slides, it has to have an adverse impact on their child's performance at school. Emotional disturbance is um, also referred to as emotional impairment in our school district. I think it helps to kind of neutralize that language. It's a condition that exhibits one or more of the following characteristics over a long period of time and to a marked degree that affects the child's performance. You only have to meet one of the five indicators in order to be eligible for special education services under an emotional impairment. These five factors can include an inability to learn that cannot be explained by any other factor, an inability to build or maintain personal relationships with both adults and peers, inappropriate types of behaviors or feelings under typical circumstances, a general pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression, and a tendency to develop physical symptoms or fears associated with personal or school problems, which typically relate to symptoms of anxiety. This impairment also includes the term schizophrenia, and it does not necessarily apply to children who are socially maladjusted unless they are determined that they also have an underlying emotional impairment. Hearing impairment means an impairment in hearing, whether permanent or fluctuating, that again impacts the child's educational performance, but is not necessarily included under the broad definition of deafness. An intellectual disability is defined by having a below average general intellectual fun, or excuse me, significantly below average general intellectual functioning 
that coexists at the same time with challenges in daily living skills. It's manifested during a child's developmental period, and again, it affects the child's educational performance at school. Multiple disabilities looks at simultaneous impairments, the combination of which causes severe educational needs that cannot be accommodated by a special education program solely for just one of the impairments. The term also does not include deaf blindness as it has its own category. Orthopedic impairments look at whether a student has a severe orthopedic challenge that adversely affects a child's educational performance. The impairments are typically caused by a congenital anomaly, impairments caused by a disease, and impairments from other causes. Other health impairment is defined by having limited strength, vitality, or alertness, including a heightened alertness to environment. And it is typically due to a chronic or acute health problems and adversely affects a child's educational performance. One thing to note about other health impairment is that just because your child may or may not have a health uh, condition at the existing moment, school districts can often suspect this area as an area of educational disability, particularly if they are concerned with self-regulation skills. A specific learning disability is defined by as a disorder in one or more of the basic psychological processes that are involved in understanding or in using language that is spoken or written and may manifest itself in the imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, speak, read, write, spell, or do mathematical calculations. It also includes many conditions such as perceptual disabilities, brain injury, minimal brain dysfunction, dyslexia, and developmental aphasia. It does not necessarily include learning problems that are the result of a visual, hearing, or motor impairment, an intellectual disability, an emotional impairment, or due to environmental, cultural, or economic disadvantage. Traumatic brain injury is an acquired injury to the brain caused by an external physical force resulting in total or partial functional disability or psychosocial impairment, or both, which affects a child's educational performance. The term applies to open or closed head injuries, resulting in impairments in one or more areas such as cognition, language, attention, reasoning, judgment, problem solving, perceptual and motor abilities, psychosocial behavior, and information processing. The term does not apply to brain injuries that are congenital or degenerative or to brain injuries that were induced by birth trauma. A visual impairment is our last category. It is an impairment, impairment in vision that even with correction adversely affects the child's educational performance at school. The term includes both partial sight and blindness. This is our school psychologist contact information. We thought it would be helpful to list all three of the school psychologists, their email address and what buildings they serve this school year. So Courtney Kaler serves Maryland Elementary, Montrose Elementary in our preschool. David Wright is a new school psychologist with us this school year. He will be servicing the middle school. And I am Kristen Rohr, and I'll be servicing Cassingham, the high school, and post high school students. Does anyone have any questions? So I thought I would end on a quote because we are probably your first point of contact with special education. So from the school psychs, we would love you to know that coming together is just the beginning for us. Staying together is a process and working together is success. And I think that's true of special education, that this is a process. It's a, a, sometimes a short process, sometimes a lifelong process. 
However, please know that we are always continuing to work together with you to make this as a successful experience for your child as possible.